Hello, is everyone there? Hello, is everyone there? Yes. Yeah, uh, sorry for that interruption. So, um, I was just going to kickstart the session today, but just a brief, just a brief mention. Uh, uh, the address from Dave Clavon, who is the Director of Application Infrastructure Portfolio Worldwide, IBM, uh, is posted on the home page of the forum. So it's a, it's an audio cast. You will see it right on top. So please go ahead and uh, and and listen to him. He has now a very good announcement on uh, VOS V8 as well as the latest release of VOS V8.5 Open Alpha. And in addition, there are a couple of uh, video recordings that have been posted uh, in 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 correlation to what's talked today. Uh, this is regarding the XC10 and the uh, WVE, that's your virtual enterprise. So please go ahead and take advantage of this video recording, uh, a brief one, which, which is a capsule of information on those cloud offerings. So with that, I'll kickstart the session today on Vexia Cloud Technologies. Hi, excuse me. Yeah, Hello? please. Yeah. Where are the videos uploaded? Right on the home page, the home page where you click register in for register here for the webinar. Okay, their uh, videos are uploaded? Yes, the audio cast right on top is addressed by David Clevon. Now we are in Lotus meeting, na? Okay. Yeah, yeah, this is, uh, you listen to the webinar now, but for later you can go ahead and view those podcasts and video cast. There, uh, where uh, the link is available for register here. Right, right on top, yes, right on top of that page. Okay, thank you. Okay, let me quickly introduce our speaker for the day, Seema. Seema is the uh, product line manager for the website application infrastructure portfolio and holds the uh, dual level responsibility in this role for India and South Asia. Uh, having over 11 years of experience in the software industry, she needs uh, she was a lead and a technical consultant for WebSphere products. She has also handled uh, several customer engagements and pre-sales engagements in her role in the lab services department. Uh, an IBM certified IT specialist, she is now going to take us to WebSphere Cloud Technologies and offerings. Over to you. Excuse me. Yes, yeah. is there a question before we start? Yeah. This is Papu Jasov from Pulon Location. I'm not able to see in the screen. Uh, Papu, can you uh, come on to the chat? There are people here that will help you in an operational uh, way to get onto the screen. Okay, so we'll start with the session. Okay. okay. Um, so, very good morning to everyone, and uh, thank you for joining uh, this webinar today morning. So uh, the topic today is uh, is on the cloud technology, and this session specifically is going to talk about what are the various technologies, product offerings uh, that is available within WebSphere uh, in, in the cloud space. So uh, I know most of you may be familiar with uh, cloud computing and the trends that are currently relevant in the marketplace. So, I, however, I would like to start with a brief overview and then uh, talk into relevant topics uh, related to Vexia. So, uh, so again, a very brief introduction, right, on what is cloud computing. So, cloud computing is nothing but a delivery model or a business model, right? So, for many of us who have been uh, using several uh, services on the Internet, uh, Cloud computing is a delivery model, right? So if you're using an email provider based on the internet, you're, you're you know, using it as a consumer. And the uh, service is delivered to you by uh, the service provider via the internet. So uh, when you talk about cloud computing as a business model, we also need to look at uh, the various uh, actors here or the various roles that are played. If you are a, a software vendor or, a, you know, software uh, application provider, uh, your responsibility is that of, you know, uh, how do you make your solutions or applications available to your end consumers uh, in a seamless fashion, and the cloud provides you a delivery model 
to publish, update, and maintain your uh, service components in a common infrastructure where uh, the, the headache of you know actually maintaining the application infrastructure, the hardware infrastructure is all uh, taken care of by the actual cloud uh, providers. If you are a consumer, on the other hand, you are basically just accessing services from the cloud. So whatever services have been published on the cloud, whether it, be, it, it may be uh, business-oriented services or any other service uh, that, that many of us consume today, uh, uh, for a service consumer, it is just an access model, an accessibility model. So, uh, so it, to put it in a very, uh, very concise manner, cloud computing is nothing but an emerging uh, form of a delivery model in which all your applications, your data, as well as your underlying IT resources, which includes your hardware and your software resources, are uh, managed in a managed infrastructure are, and are made rapidly available and provisioned uh, based on some common standards and based on some flexible pricing models. We talk about pricing models, uh, various kinds of pricing models that, that can, you know, be part of a cloud, cloud delivery model. So uh, now we go inside the cloud, right? So uh, what happens inside the cloud? So inside the cloud, uh, the role is that of a cloud administrator or the data center administrator who needs to actually maintain, manage, the various services, the catalogs of services, the components, uh, manage the data center infrastructure, monitor the infrastructure. So if you're having a shared pool of resources, uh, you also need to have a, a method of monitoring as to who is using how much so that you have a common method to do chargeback, to do uh, metric calculation, and that kind of a thing. So. Uh, uh, many of our customers today are looking at converting their existing data center infrastructures to a cloud-based uh, infrastructure. So what, uh, how, what is the transition involved? The transition is their existing data centers may, may be hosting multiple applications in a siloed environment. We try to uh, talk, uh, talk about converting them into a cloud environment where there's a shared pool of resources. Right, and uh, uh, amongst those shared pool of resources, there is a uniform chargeback and metering capability, so that you are able to also figure out as to who is using how much and and uh, utilize the resources efficiently. So, uh, to to summarize the key benefits of a cloud computing model, uh, first and foremost, it is definitely the cost optimization aspect. Right, so there is a lot of uh, benefit you gain by putting in resources together. Uh, you have better utilization, better uniform utilization of your resources across the infrastructure. Uh, uh, you, you save costs such as, you know, other costs related to hardware costs, cooling costs, uh, space, right? Real estate is not getting any cheaper, right? So how do you uh, continue to scale uh, your requirements with the existing infrastructure in a more cost-optimized manner? So uh, getting back to cloud delivery models, uh, you must have heard about uh, the three uh, delivery models related to cloud computing, uh, namely the public cloud, the private cloud, and the hybrid cloud. So uh, when we talk about a public cloud, a pl public cloud is nothing but where uh, a given enterprise owns the entire cloud infrastructure and is providing it as a, a service that can be accessed on a subscription basis, a subscription basis or a pay-as-you-go basis. So uh, as a consumer, I can, uh, you know, subscribe to the public cloud where I'll be allocated some space, right, uh, or I'll be allocated uh, some uh, access to a particular application, uh, and uh, I pay as much as I use. That is, I do not have to worry about installing that application in my own hardware, I do not have to worry about the prerequisites that are required to run the application. Uh, I do not have to worry about managing updates or fix packs or uh, patches and that kind of a thing. All that is uh, taken care of, of by the cloud service provider, and uh, he gives you a public cloud infrastructure to subscribe to and uh, you know use as 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 you may need. So. So the service that is provided may either be an application, it may be a business process, it may be an infrastructure as a service where you're getting access to computing power, uh, and each of these uh, will be priced on a flexible model. 
So uh, what do we have in IBM, uh, which is related to the public cloud uh, specifically? Uh, so the, there are a couple of options. So the, there is an IBM public cloud. It's known as the IBM Smart Cloud Enterprise, right? So over here, you can actually, you must have seen an advertisement in, in the Times of India today on this. Uh, where it talks about less than five rupees a day and you can actually use this infrastructure. So what is infrastructure? What uh, Smart Cloud Enterprise uh, provides you is, is a public infrastructure uh, where you can subscribe as a consumer uh, for a given service, right? And the services, so it also publishes a list of catalogs as to what kind of uh, environment you can subscribe to. So if you are a WebSphere uh, shop and you have applications that work on WebSphere, you can actually subscribe for a WebSphere application server environment and use that environment on the IBM Smart Cloud Enterprise to either do development, to do, do testing, or even to host your application out there. So that's, that's what we have from the public cloud space. Apart from the Smart Cloud Enterprise, we also offer similar services via uh, Amazon EC2 uh, Cloud, where you, you can you know, uh, reserve uh, requests for resources and use the same. And the third thing is the IBM Blueworks Lite, which is uh, the BPM version, uh, which is a BPM tool that is available on the cloud. And you can use that tool uh, to do your uh, high-level business process modeling. So if you need to start off or embark on a business process management or re-engineering based project, uh, you could actually subscribe to uh, Blueworks and do your initial process modeling using Blueworks. So uh, moving on, uh, the the next uh, aspect of cloud computing is on the hybrid cloud. So hybrid cloud, as the name suggests, is a mix and match of the two, right? So not all companies will go entirely public or entirely private, right? Uh, there would always be the need to connect uh, and communicate between the uh, public uh, public cloud-based services and the private cloud on-premise uh, applications that are there within the enterprise. And uh, that is where a hybrid uh, cloud computing model fits into the picture, where it gives an accessibility uh, for the uh, for the client to other partner uh, applications, uh, as well as connects it to applications within within the enterprise. So, what do we have in this space? So, if you can uh, see the chart here, uh, you can see a cast iron systems. So, WebSphere cast iron cloud integration provides you the integration between uh, the uh, enterprise, where within your enterprise you may have, say, uh, you know, uh, within within the enterprise you may have an SAP-based system, or you may have Oracle or PeopleSoft to manage your uh, HR processes, your billing processes, order management in SAP. You may have a multitude or a few of these uh, ERP or enterprise applications with running within your enterprise. However, you may want to adopt uh, a new, uh, you know, cloud-based applications such as Salesforce, for example, for managing your uh, uh, Salesforce, right, for managing the deals and managing, doing the uh, lead management and uh, tracking tracking the key deals uh, in, from, from your Salesforce. So how do you connect? So how do you link a deal in that is, uh, you know, uh, that has been flagged in Salesforce to an order that is generated in SAP? So there needs to be some connectivity between the external Salesforce application that is uh, that you access on a public cloud to the internal uh, SAP application that is within your premise. And that is where uh, WebSphere Cast Iron comes into picture. It provides you with uh, quick uh, integration points where uh, it, it comes with a set of a set of predefined templates that help you uh, define the mapping between an object in salesforce.com to an object in SAP. So it's, it's very quick to integrate, uh, and uh, we have customers who have actually implemented this kind of an integration in a matter of few days. Uh, whereas if you were to actually implement all those mediation and integration points, it would take quite a, quite a long a bit of time. Okay, so. Uh, Moving on, the major portion of this presentation is going to be focused on the private cloud aspect because that is where we see a lot of the WebSphere technologies playing, and a lot of our customers are, are today embarking upon the private cloud journey. Uh, 
So uh, what is private cloud? Private cloud is nothing but, uh, as the name suggests, it's a privately owned uh, and managed cloud uh, infrastructure. So where enterprises are uh, really, uh, you know, cautious about putting any data, customer sensitive data out in a public domain or a public cloud infrastructure, or even where the applications are uh, you know, uh, sensitive in nature, most companies or most enterprises prefer going the private cloud way. Uh, and also there is the aspect that many of these enterprises have already got large investments in terms of hardware and software, so there's no rip and replace here because the private cloud uh, journey really means reusing what you have and getting the best out of that. So uh, there is limited access uh, to, to uh, the outside client and partner network. Uh, private clouds basically help uh, drive better efficiency and resource utilization uh, and uh, helps, helps in better uh, standardization of your key processes within, within your data center infrastructure. Okay, so uh, moving on. So, so based on several customer experiences, right? So, uh, typically, the entry point into a private cloud uh, kind of a deployment is to start with virtualization, right? So uh, by virtualization, virtualization is at different levels, right? Companies will typically start with virtualization at the core physical infrastructure, the hardware or server level, right, where uh, typically you would employ virtualization technologies such as VMware uh, or PowerVM if you have uh, PCDs. Uh, to virtualize your underlying uh, hardware infrastructure. And on top of that, you actually deploy your individual application. So uh, looking at various customer experiences here, what we have seen is companies have moved in, moved out of individual deployments. The first uh, box that you see here where you have dedicated hardware, operating system, middleware uh, for a particular application to better consolidation and virtualization where you have a shared hardware, and on the shared hardware, you actually have uh, multiple virtualized operating systems and multiple applications running on top of that. And uh, finally, uh, the, the much better optimized stack is to have virtualized applications as well, so that your application is not really pinned to a particular virtualized hardware. It's virtually ap uh, available across the shared infrastructure. So what are the challenges that uh, these uh, adoption paths help, uh, you know, typically address is in terms of uh, low hardware utilization, one of, first and foremost, right? So uh, not all applications within your enterprise will behave uh, at the same level. By behavior, I mean in terms of workloads, right? You may have an application that runs uh, at a peak load during, say, the end of the month, and there is another internal application that runs at a peak load at a different time. So how do you manage those varying workloads? How do you ensure that you have better hardware utilization and you don't end up dedicating a lot of resources uh, to a given application just because it's going to peak at a certain point of time? Those are some of the challenges that is uh, typically addressed by virtualization at the infrastructure level as well as the application level, right? And uh, some of the uh, typical solutions to these uh, experiences, right, where uh, companies have experienced typical uh, bottlenecks in terms of uh, memory memory being you know overcommitted or there are too many images so, or lack of proper CPU uh, you know utilization uh, typical solutions are to go in for an application virtualized solution uh, go in for better uh, scalability and light, lighter weight applications use elastic caching and also use workload optimization so these are some of the uh, uh, technical solutions to some of the problems that are experienced here. And in the following charts, I'm going to give you a brief overview of what are the solutions that we have to help you achieve each of those objectives. So, uh, so from the perspective of an IT operations person, right? So somebody who is um, so, you know, responsible for uh, managing your IT infrastructure, your application infrastructure. What are the typical pain points? So when you have uh, projects that have multiple, you know, middleware requirements, uh, a creation of a given infrastructure does take too long. So the average lead time to get a new application up and running in an end-to-end, -end, uh, you know, highly available middleware architecture is sometimes somewhere close to four to six months. 
right? So, and there's also a delay. It's not only the setting up process uh, in large data. <laughs> You do have strong processes for approval, procurement, getting the hardware, installing the OS, ensuring that it's at the right level, ensuring your applications are using the right, uh, you know, middleware infrastructure, the right fix packs, et cetera, et cetera. So all those put together does involve a lengthy time frame, and uh, and that that's not very uh, very effective if you need to do it in a repeated fashion. Then. Uh, and most of this is done manually, right? So whatever you do manually, or if it even if it is semi-automated, there is always a scope for error. And sometimes the bugs that are introduced are due to inconsistent configuration. So we do hear this typical thing that whatever worked in development does not work in testing. It's because of some small configuration that was not done. It may be a small spelling mistake. It may be oversight. And we have had experiences where we do spend days and nights trying to figure what, what is the difference between those configurations. So inconsistent incons configurations account for 30% of the bugs that are introduced, and uh, it's very difficult to detect during a QA or production uh, kind, of a, uh, kind of a runtime. Uh, and finally, uh, the resource utilization, right? So poor resource utilization results in increased cost of labor and hardware. So setting up an environment is expensive. Uh, and it takes longer when, when you know, you have to do all these steps, and uh, hence the cost of, you know, acquiring new hardware keeps increasing. And there's always this thing that, you know, uh, since I have spent four months spending, uh, you know, trying to set up this environment, let us retain that for the next one year, because just in case we need that environment at a later time, or uh, we'll, we'll need to spend another four months to set it up. So a lot of these environments, right, UAT environments, key environments, are left as is in an ideal state for a, for a large time because just to take, take care of that just-in-case kind of a scenario because we don't have automation in place and we do have so much of pain in setting it up. So, so those are some of the typical pain points. Apart from that, the static middleware infrastructure where it does not really relate well to spikes in demand, so even if uh, even if there is a spike in demand for a per given application, there is no way that it can actually uh, utilize the resources allocated to a different one. Yeah, uh, folks, please go on mute if you are not already, just in case there is background noise from your side. Thanks. Okay, uh, and uh, the second thing is on the uh, fragile middleware infrastructure where you, a system cannot detect that a failure will probably occur, right? So many a time we are forced to uh, do firefighting or to be, uh, you know, to actually detect or actually uh, correct a situation after it has occurred, right? Uh, the middleware infrastructures we have today are not very uh, uh, robust enough to actually give you an alarm or give you an alert as to a problematic situation that's bound to occur. So, so uh, moving on to some of these pain points and what are the solutions available from IBM. Right. Uh, I guess you already went through an IBM workload uh, deployer presentation yesterday, right, Lalita? They had an IWD presentation yes. yesterday, right? So uh, you may have, in case you guys had a chance to attend that, uh, the, so IBM workload deploy, deployer is an appliance uh, from IBM that helps you deploy commonly used application patterns and workload patterns into a virtual environment. And there is a video on WBE posted today. And uh, and the other product is the WebSphere Virtual Enterprise, which helps you manage your application workloads in virtual environments. So what I was talking about, static middleware infrastructures and uh, fragile middleware infrastructures, uh, a lot of it uh, can be uh, solved by having something like a WBE in, in your infrastructure, because WBE has the capability to uh, detect those health conditions, right? So if there is a memory utilization, or a CPU utilization problem, or a memory leak, uh, WVE can be configured to detect those health conditions and also take corrective action. So corrective action can be anywhere between, you know, uh, setting that server in a maintenance mode so that it does not continue to process requests and taking all the diagnostic information, or it could even be a very simple thing like restarting the server automatically. So uh, the, at the at the end, uh, your customers are really not you know experiencing an outage because your overall infrastructure is intelligent and configured enough to handle those uh, you know uh, health conditions in an automated. <laughs>
So uh, Lalita tells me there's also a video on WV that has been posted to the website. So please, please go through that uh, for for you know more details on the virtual enterprise. Uh, the other thing that I would quickly want to talk about is the uh, hypervisor edition images. So we released the hypervisor uh, edition images along with uh, the appliance a couple of years back. And uh, what are these images? They are nothing but end-to-end uh, -end virtual images of our middleware products. Right, that are ready to run on a hypervisor environment. So if you already have a, a, a you know virtualized environment like say VMware ESX, or if you have a Power VM, uh, you can use the hypervisor edition of uh, WebSphere uh, middleware products to run on those hypervisors. So this is based on the open virtualized uh, virtualization format standard, and uh, it's it's just like an image, right? It's a plug and play. So all you need to do is copy the image to the target environment and run it. There is no installation uh, required. You just choose what kind of a profile that you need, and it's ready to go. So uh, a single uh, image can actually support multiple servers and mul and also a clustered environment. The image today is available for WebSphere application server. Uh, not only WebSphere application server, you also have hypervisor images for the WebSphere portal, for message broker, for MQ, monitor, and WebSphere web process server as well. And the good part is you really do not have to worry about uh, the underlying OS level patches, right? So if you're running on AIX, uh, the hypervisor image for AIX will come with all the prerequisite uh, AIX level OS patches as well as the WebSphere patches that are required to run on a stable environment. And uh, there is very little maintenance or support overhead on the IT operations guy to, you know, periodically procure these fixes and keep doing that because those are pushed through the appliance. So, so if you, uh, just to recap on what is IBM Workload Deployer, IBM Workload Deployer is, uh, is an appliance that maintains a catalog of several virtual system patterns. Right, uh, this is a secure, uh, self-service based cloud uh, cloud management hardware appliance. Cloud management is key here because sometimes uh, it is mistaken that uh, the appliance itself runs the cloud, which is not true, right? So the appliance is just a management device. It gives an interface for the system administrators to manage the cloud environment. So you need to come with your own hardware. So whether your hardware is X-series, P-series, or Z-series, uh, the workload deployer can actually manage the target cloud, right? And uh, the, the hypervisor image that we uh, just spoke about, so it, it has the capability of dispensing that hypervisor image into your, uh, you know, uh, existing hardware. So uh, and it's, it's not only dispensing, it also enables a full lifecycle management for third-party products, uh, third-party products as well. So uh, in case of, uh, you know, in case you have a requirement to uh, quickly bring up a highly available vast network deployment cell, right, with the cluster of five servers, all you need to do is choose the appropriate pattern in the pattern editor and choose the, you know, target IPs where you want that uh, particular uh, deployment to reside and uh, instruct workload deployer to dispense it and the rest of the job is done by workload deployer where it copies those images into the target environment uh, and uh, and also with all the configuration that you specify and you have a ready made uh, you know uh, middleware infrastructure for use up and running so uh, if the same thing if you were to do actually manually by installing configuring and uh, running all the scripts it would take much more time than what what you would uh, do with a workload deployer so uh, what what are the various deployment patterns available in Workload Deployer? You have uh, mainly the uh, virtual application patterns, virtual systems, and also uh, if you have existing software, because uh, many of uh, our customers may not run just WebSphere software, right? And uh, you could have a mix and match, right? So you could have an uh, you could have a scenario where you use uh, uh, an application on WebSphere application server that connects to, say, an Oracle database, right? So you can also run your existing so software on the target hardware. Uh, you can use Workload Deployer to uh, dispense the image. However, the image itself needs to be, uh, you know, created uh, in, in the OBS format uh, and, and loaded into the Workload Deployer. 
so uh, let's let's go to what do we mean by uh, virtual application patterns right virtual application patterns are typically built for uh, a, a very highly automated policy based deployment so if you have a, requir a requirement to to deploy a web application that has certain SLAs in terms of throughput, in terms of response times, etc., and uh, you want to leverage the uh, workload uh, management services of the underlying hardware and the uh, and the software as well. Uh, there are a set of uh, readily available virtual application patterns that help you do that, and you really do not need to worry about all the fine tuning, right, as to how much JVM heap or how much of how many threads I need to keep running and that kind of thing. All that is taken care of by the virtual application pattern. So uh, in terms of uh, uh, the value it provides, it's uh, really, really high, but in terms of the flexibility, may, maybe not as much because most of the fine tuning is taken care of by the pattern itself. The second one is the virtual system, which is a package offering for virtual environments. So it, 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 it's nothing but an automated deployment of your middleware topologies. So it's, 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 again, based on the traditional administration model. All it uh, actually gives you is the flexibility to automate that management, automate the configuration, and uh, you can use the traditional administration model to administrate it after the dispensing is done. Okay, so uh, here is an example of a virtual system pattern. I think you may have seen this uh, yesterday as well, but let me just, uh, you know, reiterate. So what does a virtual system pattern uh, provide you with in terms of uh, configuration parameters? It, uh, it can, you can actually change things like a middleware version number, right? So here in this diagram, it has a deployment manager, which is a 7017. If you want to deploy uh, version 7013, you can actually just put in that version, and Workload Deployer will ensure that, that that is the version that is deployed in the target environment. Similarly, how many nodes? So number of custom nodes. So here we have a, a, a VAS cell with four nodes. You can make it 10 nodes. You can make it five nodes. Again, it depends on what is the hardware that you have available. Uh, On-demand router is part of WebSphere Virtual Enterprise. Right, so you can have my, uh, one or two on-demand routers for intelligent routing, uh, and same goes with HTTP server. Uh, you can also include script packages. So if you have your own applications, right, you can write a WS admin scripts to automate the installation of the application and include them as part of the pattern, so that uh, when this is dispensed in the target environment, the script will kick off and will also install the application. Okay, uh, the second one is the virtual application pattern. So uh, out here things are a little different, right? So what is exposed is a bunch of policies, right? Uh, a scaling policy and a JDM policy for the enterprise application. So in these policies you can say, in the scaling policy you can tell, uh, tell the uh, pattern that, you know, this is the level of scaling. I want to scale from a minimum of two servers to a maximum of ten servers. And at runtime, uh, it will intelligently take the decision to manage the workload, how many servers it needs, uh, it, it needs to instantiate to be able to run. And uh, the virtual application patterns also provide connectors. So if you want to connect to an underlying database or an LDAP, uh, you could uh, use the connectors to connect to it. Uh, the two virtual application patterns that are currently available are the web application pattern and the database pattern. Right, uh, and uh, these are available as part of the catalog in the workload deployer. Now, uh, moving on to uh, virtual enterprise uh, very quickly, right? Uh, so we, we briefly saw what virtual enterprise was uh, a, a few charts earlier. So virtual enterprise is, again, uh, a more advanced premium offering from the WebSphere application server family, where you it typically gives you a lot of administration and management uh, functionality. So when you have a lot of applications that need to be managed on a large vast, uh, vast environment and you need to also differentiate up, up, across those applications, right? So if you have a, a application which is very business critical, that is revenue generating, and you may also have applications that are internal facing, that are reporting applications or are less critical. So virtual enterprise provides you with capabilities to prioritize your application. 
Uh, it provides you with the capability of uh, sharing your resources across those applications rather than dedicating resources to each application separately. Virtual Enterprise helps you create a pool of uh, application servers where your applications are available. And depending on the relative priority of the incoming application request, it's able to intelligently route it uh, to the best possible server. So uh, this in turn increases the resiliency of your system because uh, you really do not have too many bottlenecks arising uh, because of the static middleware infrastructure. Uh, it also provides you with uh, better health management capabilities where you can, um, you know, introduce health policies. Uh, you can actually define what are the actions to be taken if there is a health condition and uh, so on and so forth. So Virtual Enterprise, uh, to put it very uh, briefly, helps you consolidate your application servers, helps you maximize your resource utilization, and helps you in uh, helps by providing a better monitoring framework, a uh, better health management framework, which in turn results in uh, more cost savings and better productivity of your system. So, uh, so what happens when you marry the two, right? So, when you have IBM Workload Deployer uh, that is capable of deploying a, a, a now departing. Someone from Chennai. Is there any question? Okay. Okay. I think we'll take questions at the end of the session. So I'll just finish up the presentation real quick, and we can take questions after that. So, uh, so what happens when uh, you uh, you actually combine your workload deployer at the deploy now attending with the virtual? Can can you go on mute, Kiran? Or anyone that's not on mute, please go on mute. Thank you. So, uh, workload deployer is uh, very relevant to manage your cloud environments at the deploy time. And at runtime, Virtual Enterprise uh, provides you with the uh, administration and management capability to control your incoming traffic and to do policy-based request routing uh, so that you, uh, across your resource pool, you are given the best possible resources and your overall availability of your application infrastructure is much better with Virtual Enterprise at runtime. So key point to note here is the workload deployer appliance is very, very relevant at deploy time. It's not a point of failure at runtime because you're not running any workloads on the appliance. You're still running them on your existing hardware. Virtual Enterprise uh, uh, helps you provide all the capabilities to maintain and monitor the health of your uh, applications that are running in your infrastructure so that you are able to take the corrective action at the right time. Okay, so, uh, so what, we, uh, what we learned from Virtual Enterprise is mainly on application virtualization or workload virtualization, right? And many of you guys may have heard of virtualization from a server virtualization standpoint, where you have a virtualization at the server le level, and you may also be creating images, right, virtual images on your own, uh, where there are a lot of tools available that will help you actually take a snapshot of your existing, uh, you know, runtime middleware mm -hmm. infrastructure and make it a virtual image so that you can quickly copy it and use it wherever you're going. Uh, but uh, there is a subtle difference between that and the virtualization we are talking about here with virtual enterprise and the hypervisor images is that um, you really will not know what is going on inside the virtual machine, right? So for an image that you would create uh, using any other tool, uh, what are the applications that are running within that virtual machine image? How do you manage their relative priorities? What is the health of their input? <coughs> Those, that kind of an insight is not available outside the black box, right? And that is where we differentiate ourselves, where we provide with an application level awareness and management that is very, very critical to maximize the benefit of your underlying physical virtualization. So unless you're able to route your request, uh, route the incoming request based on their priorities and based on their requirements, physical requirements, uh, you are not able to uh, make the right decisions uh, if you really do not know what is running inside that black box. So that's uh, what 
is mainly different from a traditional virtualization approach to what we're talking about here with that a virtual enterprise. Okay, so uh, so that is pretty much on the virtualization aspect, the workload management, the virtualization, and the application virtualization. Now, I would like to shift gears a little bit to talk about uh, challenges at an application level, right? So everything else is fine. You can virtualize everything. You can run your applications in the virtualized environment. But what about the application itself, right? What are the uh, key things that you, you need to look at when you're developing or designing an application to ensure that it is ready to run on a cloud environment? Because a cloud comes with its own uh, requirements, and maybe not every application is ready to be deployed on the cloud just like that. So uh, what are typical things uh, that you need to look at, right? Uh, the key things are that the application does need to be scalable, right? It needs to be uh, uh, scalable to take full advantage of the resources that we are providing. It needs to be independent of any particular machine. Uh, it needs to have a very, very small memory footprint. But this is not always the case, right? We do have a lot of applications that have some kind of a bottleneck, right? The bottleneck may be in terms of data. So uh, you may have large data structures. You may have large objects in memory uh, that uh, that can turn out to be a bottleneck. So if you if your application uh, installs huge, large memory objects, uh, it may not really be the right candidate to put it onto a cloud infrastructure just as is. And uh, it's a common practice for many applications to uh, refer to file systems, right? to refer to uh, property files or config files in the file system, which in turn makes it machine dependent and platform dependent. Uh, and that, again, is not really uh, uh, very ready to be put onto the cloud. Uh, there may be applications that are not optimized for container managed processes, so typically batch programs where you have your own caching. Uh, a lot of this uh, capability, right, uh, batch processing, uh, caching, et cetera, is today handled by the container. So if your application is not uh, designed to make use of those container managed services, then uh, a lot of it depends on how well you have written those services yourself. And finally, the memory footprints, right? So a cache can contain lots of data. And if your caches are local in nature, it leads to large memory-bound systems. And uh, uh, your memory utilization can be a key bottleneck in that condition. So these are some of the things that we need to take care of when we design applications, right? And uh, the, some of the uh, solutions that are available to reduce your average JVM footprint is to come up with a global cache, right? So where uh, in, the, in, the, in the first picture where you see you have uh, multiple JVMs here that are running an application, and each of those JVMs are having a local cache. So whatever uh, objects are being cached are being stored within the same JVM. So what happens here is that within each individual JVM, uh, the the static memory, uh, the static objects that are there in the cache memory is competing for space with your application, right? And when you have uh, larger applications and growing workloads, this may not be a very scalable approach. So uh, the alternative option is to move the cache out of those local JVMs and create a global cache infrastructure. And WebSphere Extreme Scale provides you with the technology to do that across JVMs, right? So you remove that uh, additional space out of the individual JVMs, give your applications more space to breathe, right? And reduce the JVM memory footprint with smarter caching uh, solutions. And Extreme Scale is one of the solutions from WebSphere that gives you that kind of a capability. Okay, uh, so uh, in turn, when you look at it, you overlay this on a cloud-based environment. What do we see, right? So in a cloud-based environment, you may have multiple clusters, and uh, you can have a global cache uh, managed by WebSphere Extreme Scale, uh, which is fault tolerant, right? Because it does hold, uh, uh, it does uh, actually ensure that your data is uh, uh, is not lost because of one particular cache going down. There is high availability in place. It's, it's also very, very elastic in nature, right? So depending on the incoming load, you can actually uh, scale up your extreme scale infrastructure to cache, cache more and more objects. And the caching, you can either use it as a data store where uh, you can uh, cache frequently used tables or static records from the database into extreme scale. You can also cache uh, common uh, 
service endpoints, right? So if you have an ESD to do service mediation where you're going to look up uh, uh, an existing web, uh, web service uh, URL, you could actually cache that information as well so there is less overhead on your ESB, on your ESB mediation layer. Okay, uh, so uh, to to summarize on all the different, uh, you know, all the different products and technologies that I have been talking about uh, so far, right? Uh, so uh, we spoke about the IBM Workload Deployer, which is an appliance that helps you automate and standardize uh, the management of your private cloud. Uh, we spoke about the application server and the hypervisor edition of the application server that provides you the application <coughs> runtime. We spoke about extreme scale uh, that gives you scalable uh, uh, global cache and distributed data cache kind of environments to make your applications meta scalable. We also spoke about WebSphere Virtual Enterprise for a dynamic infrastructure over a virtualized layer. Uh, we really did not speak too much on the security services, uh, which is provided by uh, the data power appliances, as well as the application server provides for, for robust services, uh, security services. And we also very briefly talked about how you integrate in a hybrid cloud scenario using task and technologies. So, uh, uh, so across all these various dimensions, uh, there is a combination of WebSphere software that will help you uh, manage, and maintain, and run your applications in the private cloud infrastructure. And uh, I would just like to briefly talk about a few customer case studies where uh, some of these technologies have been adopted. And uh, not always we uh, see these projects being taken up as a private cloud pro project. Uh, the, the objective of the project mostly is to reduce costs, right? So challenges. So uh, Haddon Hill Group is uh, is a key business partner of IBM, where uh, they 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 were in the they are in the business of consulting, right? Consulting with multiple customers on their applications and also maintaining their environments for them. So uh, high operating costs, underused servers, under uh, uh, bad resource utilization, and the time required to actually configure and deploy applications being the key challenges. And uh, HSG actually used Workload Deployer very successfully to be provide, uh, you know, uh, better cost effectiveness for multiple WebSphere topologies, topologies for the different customers that they were supporting. So, they, again, uh, it was based on the WebSphere application server, uh, hypervisor edition portfolio, and uh, it resulted in a lot of cost saving and better time to market for them. Similarly, Nationwide is another customer where uh, uh, they have used WebSphere Virtual Enterprise uh, to actually combat the pain point of underutilized servers, right? So fully virtualized environment end-to-end -end, uh, right at the application level as well as the physical level uh, actually helped them free up a lot of resources and resulted in a lot of cost savings as well. Okay, uh, so this is a quick case study of Cardinal Health, uh, where they had similar things. They had cost escalating costs, and uh, because of the escalating costs, they were not able to actually uh, release a lot of new applications, and uh, many of their applications were at risk uh, due to the kind of strain that was put in the underlying infrastructure during peak loads. And uh, uh, in, in the earlier infrastructure that they had, they had dedicated systems for development, test, QA, staging, production, which they would maintain throughout the year, maintain it for their various applications, due to which the overall resource utilization in the data center was very low, and the cost was really, really high. So the overall management was not really efficient. And they also had a mix of uh, web logic servers as well as applications. So what uh, Cardinal Health did is uh, they used Virtual Enterprise to create an overall resource pool of their existing hardware, uh, and they deployed all their applications, which included uh, the high priority, medium priority, and low priority workload applications, into the common resource pool. And this gave them, uh, you know, better flexibility to actually manage those applications across the pool. And also to uh, you know man do change management things like rolling out an update to an application could be done without any downtime in virtual enterprise. So uh, 
so they reduced the delivery costs up to uh, 50% and uh, it, it also set them up for a cloud computing. So by adopting virtual enterprise and virtualization at a, as a first step, uh, the next step typically for this customer would be to automate the thing, right, by tying it up with virtu uh, workload deployer to actually automate the provisioning and deployment aspect as well. Okay, so for that, uh, I think I have five more minutes, so uh, I'm just stopping out here, and I, I hope I was able to summarize uh, at a very high level the various Webster technologies that are relevant to private cloud uh, specifically. And uh, some of these topics are pretty detailed. I uh, cannot actually cover it in one hour uh, for all of them. So uh, I'm happy that uh, the workload deployer presentation has been done already. Uh, similarly, there is a lot more detail to virtual enterprise that can be done. So if uh, there is uh, any interest that you feel is relevant uh, to your organization, uh, please do get in touch with us and we could, you know, do a more detailed, uh, you know, technical overview on what is virtual enterprise and what are the various scenarios, et cetera. But uh, at this point, if there are any questions related to this presentation or anything related, uh, I would be happy to take them right now. Hi, Seema. Hi. Uh, can you repeat uh, virtualization using cloud computing, uh, using the slides? Uh, I have only five minutes. If I were to go through the slides, it would take some more time. Uh, is there any specific question uh, you would like to ask? No, I I did not understand. That's why I was asking. Uh, any one slide, if you the first slide which you showed uh, uh, for. Uh, uh, virtualization using cloud computing. That slide, if you show and explain, that is enough for me. Okay. Uh, let me ask you. Do you understand virtualization at a at a hardware level? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So what I I was talking about is virtualization at the application level. Okay. Uh, so uh, at the hardware level, you may be having uh, any technology to virtualize your underlying hardware. Right, but uh, at the software level, so what virtual enterprise helps you do is uh, it helps you create a, a virtualized environment for your application. So you may have say, 10 applications today, and traditionally what we do, we uh, deploy an application in a given hardware. So it's not available anywhere else other than the given hardware, right? So uh, if, if there is another hardware or there is another environment uh, out there that is that is running idle, there's no way that uh, your application can make use of that hardware because it is physically pinned down to a particular system. What we mean by application virtualization with virtual enterprise is to make the application available virtually across your entire resource pool. So in your, in, in your uh, setup, if you have 10 physical servers, your application can be run on any of those 10 servers irrespective of, uh, you know, where it has been deployed on. Because at runtime, what Virtual Enterprise will be able to do is to figure out which of the servers is the best candidate. So an application may have an SLA that it has an average response time of 2 milliseconds, right? Or it needs a throughput of uh, something, right? A very high throughput. So if that is a high priority application, what Virtual Enterprise will do is send that request to a very high-end system, say a power system, right? Uh, or, or, or to a system that is running very low on CPU right now so that it gives it the maximum resources to run that application and give you that SLA, which you cannot do today if your application is pinned down to a particular system in a static middleware infrastructure. That's basically what is the virtualization concept at an application level. Can you show me the slide, first slide on virtualization using cloud computing? Um, the PDF will be uh, uploaded just now in about a short while. So uh, you could just go over it. Uh, can I get the name? Sorry. Yeah, we didn't get your name. Can you? Can you? Hello. We didn't get your name. Krishna. Krishna, the PDF is uh, the is already uploaded. The presentation deck has been uploaded. So okay. uh, you could go over to the slide, first slide, and uh, let us know if you have any questions on that. 
No, actually, uh, going through the slide and explaining, then that will be much better. Then uh, I will be better to under, I will be able to better understand. That's why I was asking to show slide and explain. Okay, good. I am not able to go to anywhere. This, 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 stop. I see my here one question. Um, Apra, have you removed my rights? I think she's removed my rights. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Krishna, I think there is some difficulty because I've been taken out of the presentation mode. I may not be able to switch. Uh, but you can briefly tell his mother slide. Uh, are there any other questions in the meanwhile? Uh, yes, I own question. Uh, I see, ma. Yes, yes, please go. Uh, yes, actually, you are telling us server uh, virtualization and application virtualizations. We need to do both as well as, or we can do only one at a time. Yeah, okay, that's a good question. Uh, so ideally, if you have both, you get the best benefit because with hardware virtualization, uh, you do get better hardware management capabilities and uh, better, uh, you know, management of your virtual processors and that kind of thing. But however, if you're just going with virtual enterprise today, so if you have uh, today a non-virtualized infrastructure uh, where you have your traditional operating systems installed and, you know, middleware installed, you can still use virtual enterprise only for application virtualization. Okay, you want to say according to our requirement we can go? See, instead of yes, according to your requirement. Yeah. But uh, the recommended and the long-term approach would be to have both of them so you get maximum benefit. Oh, it means any one server failed means it will take another virtualization server will take. Any application one failed means it will take another, like the load balancing. Yeah, correct. But the cost under both are same, no? that whatever we do at a time, it, the cost to be less compared to with, uh, if you do anything. Uh, so the cost benefit, see, with virtual enterprise, the main primary cost benefit is that you will need Res lesser resources, right? Lesser hardware resources to run the same kind of a work. Yes, yes, I understood to go. By one, you make it a virtualization per 10 minutes, 11 will work for all applications. Yeah, correct. Uh, we are making that a single instead of making 10. That 10 yes. Nine, out of 10, 9 is a virtualized. That is a one box, like that black box. Yeah, one. yeah. And yeah. application as well, you deploy one application, make it that virtualized 10 instance per single application. It will, 10 applications is free of cost only. But instead of single environment, we are making a 10 environment. If anything, one failed, it will occupy with other nines. <coughs> right. You're right. Okay. But we need to do, see, on application server installed, we need to do all the everything, cloud computing. We need to all the, in, in, need to install all the workload deployer, everything we need to install at a time, no? No. We so if your the, applications are already installed, right, uh, you can actually, uh, so what you, what you could do is, you know, use workload deployer. Okay. Uh, uh, and you can create scripts for installing your applications and load that into workload deployer so that you can automate it in future. Okay, but so what you have done right now is maybe a manual thing, right? You've already done it. Yes, already. Deployed. But for future for future deployments, you can automate that whole thing with workload deployer. Okay, okay, okay. So any one instance failure means automatically the workload yeah. will make into uh, looking to another instance. Like the right. we are creating in server like that only. Right. But the workload deployer separate na, not come with along with the server na. You need to buy that uh, hardware or we need to install separately. So workload deployer is a separate appliance, okay. right? And it will work with your existing hardware, whatever you have. So it, you you just need to plug it into your existing uh, network and uh, you know give it uh, the information of all the IP addresses of your hardware. Okay. And then you now you have a new control point via the appliance. No, that is our locally we can install or we need to use it remotely, the total deployer. No, you have to locally install. You have to procure okay. the appliance in your data center and install it there physically. Okay, but it's in license system only, not free of cost. Of course, it is licensed. But uh, any other uh, was 8.5 and some, something new release will come in, uh, that under not coming all the setups. Uh, all uh, single set won't come anything. It will come all a separate separate. Yeah. I, I didn't get your question. No, no, no. See, all we need, all installed we need to do at a time means 
the ibm not providing a single set of all the thing everything the workload deployer was 8.5 ah uh, okay so so workload deployer comes preloaded with hypervisor images okay okay and uh, depending on what you need if you are using only wasp you need only wasp hypervisor images okay. right so you need to uh, so what uh, from a licensing standpoint you need to license the appliance itself okay also you need to license the entitlement as to how many uh, you know pvus of wasp hypervisor edition do you need so depending on your existing hardware infrastructure and depending on how many uh, processing cores that you will be running wasp on that much of license entitlement also needs to be purchased okay okay, okay. oh that's also on the level up that one hypervisor also one level up that server itself no yes yes that we need to purchase along with the server uh, with the hypervisor also that whatever uh, that uh, deployer with the deployer so but if you already have existing licenses of wasp okay you can actually trade that up and you know convert it into a hypervisor edition license Okay, that also not free of cost, no. That all license, no. So there'll there'll just be a delta cost associated with it. Okay, okay, okay. And one more thing, the IBM providing all the two clouds, the private, public, and hybrid. Hybrid. Uh, so IBM, uh, so private clouds is mainly all these technologies help you build your own private cloud in your enterprise. The public cloud offering from IBM is IBM Smart Cloud. Oh, cloud means what? Some data stored. Yeah, the hard thing. somewhere else we are sending request we can get that like that only the cloud will working na huh? we not paying any extra thing but that is for a public cloud okay what i i was talking about was private cloud where you want to convert your own infrastructure into a private cloud environment okay within your enterprise we we have another uh, question on chat uh, there's one person nilan this is a visualization of application using the existing hardware what kind of cost is involved with this solution is there a red book or ibm study material for this technology uh okay so the cost of this entire solution it i mean i i can only give you the uh, uh common answer as that it depends right so it depends on how much of hardware how big is your cloud infrastructure uh, uh i do not think there is a red book that covers all these things there may be individual red books uh, what was the third thing he was asking uh one of the Yeah, so uh, you will find a red book on IBM Workload Deployer. You will find a red book on Virtual Enterprise. Uh, however, you will definitely need to take help from IBM uh, services teams or consulting teams to help you build this private cloud as we have been describing here, right? So that's our overall engagement uh, activity. Okay, any trial version is available. The cloud, the not cloud, that uh, whatever workload deployer, no trial version. Like the server, all 90 days uh, we can download trial version. No, so the IBM workload deployer is an appliance, right? Uh, so if you are interested, uh, you please do get in touch with us, and we can figure out what we can do for a trial thing. Okay. But there's nothing openly available. No. Okay. Whom should contact? That we need to we need to do sample demo like that means whom to contact. Who's the contact person you've given here in in all these webinars? There's no such. May, uh, can you post us? Uh, can you give us a post, uh, uh, Krishna? That is Krishna. Hey, Ratna Swami in this year. Ah, Ratna Swami, can you give us a post on the blog so that we can uh, see what exactly is the requirement and uh, and probably get in touch with that particular department to get it enabled. If you're talking about an on-premise enablement or enablement on a webinar or so just just give us in writing okay. so that we can get the right engagement there okay okay this another question from pranit pranit are you there this is about uh will it be sas or ias on cloud since we can also move data center into cloud Can you expand on your question, Pranit? Yeah, so I think I understand your okay. question. So, uh, Pranit, I think your question is: Is it a, a, a software as a service or an infrastructure as a service on the cloud? Yeah, so, exactly. Right. So, uh, so again, right? I have, in the beginning, I spoke about uh, the individual um, actors involved, right? So, within your enterprise, right? If you want to convert your existing data center into a cloud-based model. 
it it is up to you whether you want to offer your services externally as a software as a service or as a infrastructure as a service. But uh, let me give you an example. So suppose you have uh, you are an application vendor and you have a solution, uh, say for uh, say for banking, right? And uh, you want to offer it to a bunch of banks, uh, small banks, as a service. So you don't want the banks to buy their own hardware, install software in their local locations. You would be hosting it as a service within your data center and providing it as a service to your customers, which are the banks. That is software as a service. So all these technologies that I was speaking can be can be used to actually manage and implement that kind of an infrastructure to provide software as a service externally. Okay. Okay. So that's that's how you have to look at it. He's also asking Whereas the IBM public cloud, right, the smart cloud enterprise provides you an infrastructure as a service as well. So you don't have to, you can actually reserve, uh, you know, uh, so many processors or some kind of a configuration that you need and use that infrastructure for whatever development activity or whatever you may want to do. Okay, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Pranit, you also had a question on Azure. Yeah, uh, in this uh, we can we can also use a different cloud services, right? Uh, like uh, the one from Amazon or one from Microsoft. Yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> so you keep on. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks. Thank you for that. So, so run from Azure. Is, so if you have .NET based applications, that's when you go with Azure, right? But if you have yeah. JT based applications, you may require WebSphere to run it. That is where you yeah. would go to the IBM Smart Cloud Enterprise or even Amazon EC2, which provides you web sphere images. Yeah, that's, that's what I hear. That's why I want to confirm you. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Thank you. So, um, any any further questions? Yeah, not question. I'm not able to open the page. That whatever you think in the presentation as well as that speak that to download. But the page is not opening. Opening, but I'm, the page cannot display I'm getting. It will upload. Are referring to the video recording or? Yes, both. Video recording, I think, sir. That uh, you have given on URL, no? Okay, you should be able to. Uh, that uh, that I have been able to open it from here. So, yeah. it could be a network issue. Get it prior after a little time. Yes, it should be open. Uh, hi, Sima. I am Jitan from Pune. Yeah. Uh, can you please explain what is virtual uh, imaging in terms of application? Okay, uh, so in terms of an application, right? So uh, yeah. if you were to convert, uh, I'm, I'm taking an example of an application that is de deployed on WebSphere application server, for example, right? Okay. So you have an J2E application, you have the ER file, you've deployed yeah. it into WebSphere. WebSphere in turn runs on an operating system. Yes, yes. Right? So now to get your application up and running, what are the steps that you need to follow in a new environment? You have to install the OS. You have to install all the fixes on the OS. You have to install WebSphere. You have to configure WebSphere. If you require high availability, you have to set up a cluster. Then you install your application. Then you start your application. Then it is up and running. Okay. Okay? Now, if this entire thing, if I were to automate and put it into a virtual image file, and yeah. I give you that image file, right, where you, which you copy in any server, and it is up and running just like that. So how we can create the image file? So the image file, so uh, the WebSphere hypervisor edition, right, is an image file. Okay, okay. Without your, application, without your application, so it will have everything from the OS till the WebSphere level. On top of that, you add your application. Okay. Or oh, suppose in our uh, application server, there are uh, 10 instances already running, and suppose mm -hmm. you would like to do some clouding of all the... 10 instance which is already existing and deploy we have we have already deployed the war file then we have need to go all the 10 instance clouding or only one instance clouding is sufficient uh 10 instance uh, so no so you will have to uh, redo that via workload deployer to create virtual images you'll have to capture that information and convert it into a virtual image and later on you can do 10 instance and 100 instance it's all the same no, see, my, my, my question is, if the 10 instance means you're working with the same application flow, means no need to all the need to 10, no? only one instance end up, no? Ah, so if it is all the same, any one, yes. Yes, our purpose we are doing is testing purpose, a separate instance we created for the same instance. No, but, but all the 10 instances have a different HTTP port. 
so how the application server will identify that uh, this http report i have done the clouding so what do you mean by clouding clouding means uh, whatever the setup is there we suppose you have to improve the some, some maintainability and security to improve the performance of applications at, at that time we are going for clouding um i don't know if i understand it properly but what i i think your question is how do you convert your existing non cloud static infrastructure into yes, cloud yes, based yes. environment right yes, yes, yes. so that is where uh, you need to have workload deployer to manage the various ip groups and use the workload deployer to do the installation configuration so you need to actually clean up that setup and do all the deployment via workload deployer and workload deployer will have the information on ip addresses http uh, ports and all those things you mean to say only the var or jar are in of that for deploying that's no need for whatever existing instance set up under no. no because all that information is already available with workload deployer no oh, my question is you create a air file just that air file you know for that to doing the workload deployer so putting into cloud yeah from your end you just need to bring your application I believe that air content that what yes. uh, uh, we are deploying through admin console now. That yes, yes. Also, one question is: suppose in our applications, uh, application server is running. Suppose we would like to plug in our application server to iPlanet web web server, and there is some uh, option. Other option is there through that we can plug in app, uh, web server iPlanet application server through this uh, uh, latest technology cloudy. So you're saying instead of the IBM HTTP server, if you want to use iPlanet, as yes, platform. we would like to integrate because whatever the static content is there, we we would like to deploy in the web server, and whatever the dynamic content is there, we will deploy into the application server to improve the performance of application. So that will be outside so, the purview because uh, we do not have images for iPlanet web server. If you can create your own images, you can load them in the workload deployer. That's about it. Okay. okay. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, if, if there are no further questions, uh, a quick, quick preview to what you will see in the afternoon. We have a session on VOS feature packs. Uh, this will be a very important one to attend, especially because it maps or it might map to specific requirements that you may have. For example, Web 2O or CA address specific requirements that you may have. And uh, this will be an important education because almost four to five feature packs, the key feature packs, will be covered in this session. So please do uh, come back for the three to four session. We'll open the teleports from 2.30 onward. So please do join in. Before that, uh, a quick reminder, Dave Clavon's uh, audio cast on the recent announcement of VOS 8.5 and VOS V8 uh, uh, key features is there. So please be part of that. Please listen through that. And there is also a couple of recordings in correlation with the session that we just have today, which is on WV and XC10, right on the home page. So for your perusal. And there's a block students running, and there is uh, the expert workbench running. So if you have any questions on performance or migration or security, please do post it for, so that you can get answers from the SMA sitting in the lab. So thank you again and see you all at 2.30. Thank you.